today at the National Press Club, former Treasurer and former Australian Ambassador to the United States, Joe Hockey. Mr Hockey will talk about what a Donald Trump or Kamala Harris presidency could mean for Australia. Former Ambassador Joe Hockey with today's National Press Club address. Hello and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia for today's Westpac address. My name is David Crow and I'm the Chief Political Correspondent at the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age of Melbourne and a director here at the club. Our guest today is Joe Hockey, someone we've not seen on the podium here for many years. He is of course Australia's former ambassador to the United States and former federal treasurer, an insider in many of the big economic and national security events that have shaped the nation over the past decade or more. Mr Hockey is here to discuss the coming US election and the competing campaigns from the two contenders, former President Donald Trump and current Vice President Kamala Harris. He joins us in Canberra after seeing both sides up close recently at the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee and the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. First a brief recap of Joe Hockey's career. He entered federal parliament in 1996 the first of seven elections he won for the Liberal Party in the federal seat of North Sydney. He became a minister, workplace relations minister in the John Howard government, not an easy portfolio at the time. He did four years as shadow treasurer when Labor held power under Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard and was part of the coalition team that swept into power in 2013 with Tony Abbott as prime minister. He was treasurer in that government until the leadership spill in late 2015 and at that point became uh, Australian ambassador to uh, the United States based in Washington DC from January 2016 to January 2020, a time when uh, that overlapped with Donald Trump as president. So he's seen a truly dramatic time in Australian and US politics. He now leads a quieter life as the head of Bondi Partners, an advisory and investment term. At least I think it's a quieter life. He can inform us about that in a moment. This is not a standard Westpac address. It's a conversation and I'll kick off here on the couch uh, with some questions before we then hand it over to the journalists in the room for a Q&A. Please welcome Joe Hockey here to the podium today. <laughs> so Joe, thank you for having some time to talk to us today. I think one of the sort of opening questions is really to set the scene about where things stand in US politics. From this distance, it looks like an incredibly bitter and divided electorate in the United States. And uh, you know, with two opposing sides that never seem to be able to compromise. Are we looking at a US election in November that actually resolves that? Or are we destined for that to continue no matter who wins in November? Well, it's a good question, David. Uh, and thanks for having me here. Um, the division in America is primarily about policy and not personality, even though that's a big driver of, of interest in politics. Um, at the Republican uh, convention, it was clear to me that there wasn't a deep, uh, lifelong abiding affection for Donald Trump from the delegates. What they were do was doing was fighting for what they believed to be the policies that mattered to them. Lower taxes, less regulation, stronger borders, uh, you know, a greater focus on America first. And uh, at the Democratic Convention, you know, I had four days at the Republican Convention talking about Trump, then I had four days at the Democratic Convention talking about Trump. So I was a bit trumped out by that stage. <laughs> um, and, it, you know, there is a deep divide on policy and, uh, and that, that is driving uh, the main support, between, between, you know, for Trump and for Harris. And the fact that uh, Harris was able to rebuild the enthusiasm very quickly, but at the end of the day hasn't got over 50 in any of the polls, mm. uh, just goes to prove that there's not many undecided voters left in America. And if they are, they will be exhausted. They're so hammered with ads and face-to-face -face engagements and phones and, you know, they've switched off. So you've been going there for many years as a parliamentarian and then based there as an ambassador. Do you think that America is more divided now than ever? Has it gotten worse over the time that you've been going there 
Is there any prospect of it ever getting any better? Oh, you know, according to people that were there, 1968 was far worse. And right. You had the assassination of Bobby Kennedy. You had the assassination of Martin Luther King. Uh, you know, George Bush said to me, he said he remembers it vividly, and uh, he said it was far worse. 19 American cities on fire over race. They, and every night on TV, they were losing people at Vietnam. It was the first televised war, if you like. It was, it, he said it was far worse, and, and, and the divisions in America were far deeper. And it's, you've got to have that sense of history. So I endeavour to speak to all these different people that were there and involved. You speak to some of the older congressmen and women and so on, and they say America has had deeper divisions uh, in the past. OK. It's just... Um, now, but, you know, the whole world knows about it, partly because of social media, but also uh, the voice of the critic in this world involving social media, the voice of the critic is much louder than the voice of the advocate. And that you get drowned out. Whenever you have something positive to say, you usually get drowned out by the critics. And I think that's made uh, American politics much more accessible, but it's also led to people being misinformed. We should go straight to one of the big questions, which is who's going to win. So uh, I've asked you this privately before, but I think we should just get it out there now. Who do you think is most likely to win at this point? Is well, that's it possible why everyone's to even here. Say? I just want to... <laughs> You know, uh, you'd be a fool to call it now. I mean, the, the truth is, Harris needs to win by two to three points. So Hillary Clinton uh, beat Trump. There's been five elections in the US where uh, the popular vote, you win the popular vote, but you don't win the Electoral College. And um, at the moment, there, there, are, there are a few flat factors at play. The first is uh, Hillary must... Uh, sorry, Harris must win by, in my view, 2.5% the popular vote. And her popular vote is not as high as Biden today. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is it's really hard to read if everyone that voted for Biden in 2020 is going to vote for Harris again. Uh, there's no doubt she's winning the enthusiasm battle. Yeah. But... Um, you know, it, it, it's really hard to read. And, and She's not only the first uh, woman really running for president from California. Don't underestimate how significant it is it's California. Um, but she's also the first woman of colour running. And there is still an element in the United States that is both misogynistic and racist. And, and because of voluntary voting, it's really hard to work out what the turnout is going to be. Um, so, yeah, I'm not giving a definitive answer, but Trump is very competitive for this reason. And I know I'm going to get a head nod around the room when I say this. I think out of every 100 people voting for Trump, four to five would not admit it. They're just going to do it. And the polls have just been consistently wrong about Trump. Uh, take Wisconsin. They underestimated Trump's vote by 7% yeah. in 2016, yeah. and they underestimated by 5% in 2020. Can I just follow up on what you said at the beginning there? You think that Kamala Harris would need 52.5% of the national if, if, vote? If every vote were cast... I mean, that would be astonishing in Australia if either side won 52.5. Yeah. I mean, that's a really healthy margin by Australian standards. But you're talking there about the complexity of the Electoral College. Correct. And, look, it's not inconceivable. So... I said it here first, it's not inconceivable that you could have a tied electoral college. Now, it last happened, I think it was 1800. But if you had a tied electoral college following through the process, there would be a vote of the Congress uh, early in January of the new Congress. And if that were to occur, who knows how it would go. But so, and it'd just be one vote from each state. So it's really quite interesting that you know, they've got these, this capacity to complicate everything and, uh, and that could really do it. And it's, and it's entirely feasible with the Electoral College system. It, it could end up tight. Highly unlikely, but it could. It's that close. Is it entirely feasible that there might be riots if Donald Trump was not elected? Are we looking at things being that fractured in the United States? I think the greatest risk to, uh, you know, civil society 
of recent times, in my period in the US, uh, unquestionably was if, tragically, that uh, assassin's bullet had have taken him out. I mean, you, it, it, the, the deep sense of anger amongst Democrats and Republicans. It's really quite interesting. You don't see it here in Australia, and I spend more than half my life in the US. Um, but th there's two things that really struck me on the ground in the US. The first is the deep grief of both sides at the, you know, the, the attempt on Donald Trump's life. And everyone saw graphically how close it was. And it was a failure by the Secret Service. Mm. I mean, a really serious failure. And Donald Trump, like a number of others, isn't at risk just because of domestic stuff. The Iranians are out to really get him and Pompeo and Brian Hook and a number of other people that ordered the assassination of Soleimani. So he is a very high risk. Um, and that would have... And the failure is so egregious by the Secret Service the conspiracy theorists would have been running amok. Um, and I, you know, were, everyone was relieved at that un unbelievable escape. Um, and, and that's significant. And the second thing which people don't realise was when Biden was still the candidate, and this was obvious at the Republican convention, there was no celebration of the cognitive decline of Joe Biden. People were really upset about it. And the Republicans and Trump were careful enough not to exaggerate it or really even to talk about it. And why? Because so many of the people, in, so many people in America say that could be my father, my grandfather, right? And there was just sadness about, you know, Joe Biden's cognitive decline. And so, you know, it's ironic, but there was relief, great relief in the democratic yeah. circles, but there was relief in Republican circles that he chose not to go on. And I think that shows that the country is much more mature than people realise. OK. Mm. Um, there's now an entire movement built around Donald Trump. You know, it's like a personal takeover of the Republican Party. Well, that's the way it's often portrayed with the Make, Astra Make America Great Again movement. If Donald Trump loses in November, is that the end of the MAGA movement, do you think? Or does that then continue even if he does not lead them on to another presidential campaign? No, it continues. He is the most influential figure in American politics and, well, as far back as he can go, um, at least to Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, Why is we, that? We, because of his personal appeal with yeah, this base I mean, that he's galvanised? You have never seen, a, you know, 35% of the voting population of America support Donald Trump, whether he's a Republican or a Democrat or independent. I mean, you've never seen anyone with that influence. Mm. And you go to the Republican convention, so I went in 16, which is the last open convention, and there were two conventions. There was the old guard Republicans outside saying, Trump will never win, don't worry, and then inside it was all Trump, Trump, Trump. This time around, there were no... There was no... The endorsements came from the head of the Teamsters, right? The, the, you know, there was no former president there endorsing him. There were no... Uh, you know, influential ex-Republicans endorsing him. I mean, he was... That'd be like... You know, the head of the Teamsters speaking at the Republican convention would be like John Seckes speaking at the Liberal Party convention, right? <laughs> I mean, that's what it'd be. And it, it was just absurd. And, in fact, the, the Teamsters just had a vote of the union. And this is... Bear in mind, the Teamsters were the ones that put Kennedy in back in the 60s, right? The Teamsters had a vote and 52% of the members voted to support Trump. And the leadership of the Teamsters was so shocked that they said, we're not endorsing anyone because they're pro-Democrat. So th there are so many swirls around. Does it matter that Dick Cheney, former Vice President, is not supporting Donald Trump? No. Does that carry much influence? No. And why not? Because he's the old guard of the Republic? He's... I don't think Dick Cheney's a, a popular hero for many people in America. Yeah. And, and, you know, and Liz Cheney, I, I mean, I can understand fully why she came out, but it's also, there's a bit of a play to have maybe a Republican in a Harris administration, and that's why they rush out early, people rush out early to, to endorse a candidate in the hope that, that they'll be rewarded with something further down the track. Now, 
according to opinion polls that we've done and others have done in Australia, uh, more Australians want Kamala Harris to win than Donald Trump. I mean, this is the Australian view. That's no news to anybody, I suppose. But it does highlight that it's very hard for Australians to relate to an American electorate which is so divided and which has so many Donald Trump supporters. Australians who think that Kamala Harris is the natural contender here may struggle to understand why an American would be drawn to Donald Trump. What is it that you think attracts American voters to Donald Trump? Is it his personality or is it actually just what he offers them in, in policy? Yeah, look, it's something I've, I've thought long and hard about for quite a few years now. And um, we, we created a, a, a fictional person in the Liberal Party called uh, Betty Bankstown. And Betty Bankstown was the swing voter, marginal voter, marginal seat voter that we really need to win. And I created Mary Milwaukee, right? Mm -hmm. Mary Milwaukee is 45 years of age, a mum with two kids. Her husband is one of two million truck drivers in the US never went to university. She's worked at Walmart, you know, for the last 20 years, sort of around 10 to $15 an hour. Couldn't get more than that. Her oldest her son, her oldest child, has done three tours of duty of mm -hmm. Afghanistan and come back with PTSD. She hopes and prays that her daughter could get to college, but she can't afford it. And she goes to church twice a week, Wednesdays and Sundays. She believes marriage is between a man and a woman. Uh, she has traditional values. You know, guns have been passed through the family over the years. She is very community focused. And she was sick and tired of everyone lecturing her about her life and how embarrassed she should be about, you know, the way she lived and what she believed in. And, and that built up over the Clinton years and the Obama years and she watched Jimmy Kimmel or Colbert and they laugh at her. And it's like the elites laughing at her. And she just quietly sat there and she just wants security. She doesn't want people stealing the jobs. She, she frets about her neighbours losing their manufacturing jobs. And you know what? Along comes Donald Trump in 2016 and says, you know what, Mary, I'm going to fight for you. I, I, you know, I, not only hearing what you say, I am going to fight for you against the establishment, against Washington. I'm not, not going, not, I'm not going to let them laugh at you anymore. And you know what? Mary said, I don't care. He's as rude as hell. I don't like the way he behaves, but he's, fight, he's the first person to come along and fight for me. And you know what? More women voted for Donald Trump than Hillary Clinton in 2016. White women. More white women voted for Donald Trump than Joe Biden in 2020. And Mary Milwaukee now, I keep applying her as a test uh, during the debate and everything else. I'm saying, what's Mary thinking? And she switched off early on in the debate. But the debate started on the economy. And she, you know, Mary is the one paying the bills. Mary is the one worried about another war. You know, it's not the, the pimply faced billionaires in Silicon Valley that are sending their kids to war, mm -hmm. or Wall Street, they're not going to fight in Ukraine or Afghanistan or wherever else it is. And, you know, Mary, Mary is going to decide this election. Does it matter at all when, during the debate, Donald Trump talks about immigrants eating cats and dogs in you know, Ohio? I mean, I mean mate, does, does that even backfire on him in any way? <laughs> well, like you, like everyone, I just go, oh, God, where did that come from, right? It's like... I've heard some things from Donald Trump over the years that... Uh, well, I, I watch Colbert and Kimmel as well, and I, you know, it's a, they're having a field day with Donald Trump. Every and you night. know what? Every time they do, they talk about immigration, which gets it back on the topic. Yeah. And, I mean, it, you know, American politics is, 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 is on a number of fronts, it, it's, it's a failure and, uh, in, in terms of communication, but it's all about cut-through. And they'll raise something absurd... And if that gives them the cut through, then they're on the topic that needs to be discussed to help them. So the Republicans do better on the economy and on immigration. And everyone's talking about cats and dogs in Springfield, yeah. right? Well, what they're really talking about is Im illegal is immigration. immigration. And when you de your opponents are talking about illegal immigration, then you're on the topic that wins you votes. Yeah. It's really absurd. You know. what, what should Australia be watching for or worried about in either scenario here? Does it, in what way is this outcome in November going to really shape 
shape the future for Australia, do you think, in either scenario? I think Australia is in an incredibly good position with both candidates. I think there are a lot of countries that are fretting about Trump being elected. There's a number of countries that are fretting about Harris being elected. You, you know, parts of Eastern Europe, uh, parts of South America are fretting yeah. about Harris. Um, there's no doubt Harris, if she's elected, will be tested early by adversaries of America, which may have consequences for us. There's no doubt about that. Whereas Trump is a known known and, um, you know, he always says he's going to negotiate with someone, but at the end of the day, he does add steel because he's unpredictable. Well, take China as an example. Does, does a Trump presidency bring uh, more stability to China? Is Harris more of an unknown quantity with China? Um, does she inherit the, the policies that Joe Biden has taken towards China? And should Australia therefore be be watching for what ha might happen around Taiwan under a Harris presidency. So, look, well, don't forget, Donald Trump imposed tariffs on China. Yeah. Joe Biden kept them. Donald Trump has said, I'm raising you these tariffs again, 60% on all Chinese imports. If half of what Donald Trump is promising is implemented, or if what Harris is promising is implemented, uh, America's economy is going to have substantial and significant structural problems. And price uh, increases. Oh, massive, of course. Tariffs are a massive contributor to increases in price. But you'll see the US dollar drop, most particularly under Trump, because there's no handbrake. It is singularly the worst election campaign in living memory for anyone that cares about economics. It is. It, it is ground zero in terms of making promises that are unfunded and probably cannot be delivered. But who knows? I think Donald Trump's policy platform is absurd in its largesse. And I've said it to President Trump. You can't keep spending. I mean, he ran massive deficits. Massive deficits. In the 10th year of economic growth, America basically goes into recession every 10 years. And he, he was running structural deficits, as far as the eye could see, to the extent that today America's interest bill is bigger than what it spends on defence, right? Now, they're looking at uh, a structural deficit of 5% of GDP at the moment, in inf to, yeah. you know, as far as you can see. And how are they going to fund it? Well, they say, well, you know, Congress says, well, we've got the US dollar. Everyone has to buy the US dollar. So then... Everyone who's sensible says, well, there's got to be an alternative. Bitcoin or, or maybe, you know, uh, another currency. So what does Trump say? I'll put an extra tariff on anyone that doesn't use the US dollar. And over here, I'm embracing Bitcoin. So you... Now, I'm not sure Donald Trump knows what, how Bitcoin works. <laughs> but he's, he's embracing something because he knows that his policies are not only inflationary, but they're hugely expansionary. It's like a sugar hit. It's handing a box of chocolates to, to a four-year-old. So you have had some experience in trying to tell Donald Trump that maybe tariffs are not such a smart idea, <laughs> and I think that happened over a game of golf yeah. uh, when he was trying to put tariffs on Australian steel and al aluminium. That was a huge effort to stop that. Just tell us about the game of golf. Well, how, did, how did it go down? How, how was he at playing golf? Did he cheat? <laughs> no, he doesn't cheat. He doesn't cheat. He doesn't need to cheat. He's a good golfer. He's off 13, genuinely off 13. Um, but Bill Clinton cheats on golf. Um, <laughs> but he's a great guy, but he does. He's, oh, let me play that shot a third time. <laughs> um, but, no, Donald Trump doesn't need to. And look, he, privately he's got a curious mind, Donald Trump. He asks a lot of questions about a lot of subjects. And, yeah, first time I played with him it was Mueller, uh, Alexander Downing, as he called him. Uh, Alexander Downer and how it all started. The, it was the former foreign minister <laughs> based in London who had met somebody who was talking about uh, Russian no, leaks. It, right? Australia was... It, it was at the epicentre of the whole debate. Right. And people don't realise that. We kept it massively under wraps. And uh, I worked closely with Bill Barr, who was Attorney General, managing the fallout from that. And, uh, 
Yeah, look, it, it, Donald Trump, is, you know, he takes an idea and he'll run with it. So you can see it in his policies at the moment. I mean, But I, could you do that on tariffs? When, if you're playing golf with him, did he ever acknowledge that what he was trying to do on tariffs would harm Australia and therefore he had no, to stop? No, but you had to do a deal with him to get him across the line. So he always... He, everything's a deal. Yeah. Every leader I've worked with, whether, you know, here in Australia or elsewhere, they default to what they know and what got them there in the first place. So if you're a lawyer, you behave like a lawyer. If you're a banker, you behave like a banker. If you're, you know, if you're a, 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 a celebrity, you behave like a celebrity. And because that's how you got there. That's how you got, you know, you won. And so Donald Trump is a traitor. He, you know, so uh, I had to give him something which would help to get him across the line. He, wa he, wanted, to, he wanted to feel as though he won. And Australia at that time had to use everything it could, the defence relationship, for instance, to, to hold them back on, on slugging us on so the, steel the, and the, aluminium. Yeah, so as Trump said, I think yesterday, the day before, uh, he doesn't need Congress to impose tariffs. So he does an unnational security power. And, um, uh, and we had to deploy a whole lot of different, you know, uh, people. And Malcolm Turnbull was very good about it, and then Scott, Scott Morrison and various others, to basically point out that Australia is not a national security threat to the US. You'd think that's easy, but it wasn't. They it was, needed convincing, did they? they? they needed, well, he needed convincing. And, we, look, and the people that he... If he's elected, I know the people that are going to be running his economic policy, and, you know, they're hell-bent on big tariffs, absolutely hell-bent on it. And, but they also recognise that there's a limit to what others will have. Now, you say, well, how do American tariffs affect me? Uh, America, under Biden, used the Inflation Reduction Act to squeeze out Chinese EV, electric vehicles, right? So they didn't qualify for the bonuses under the IRA. So what did they do? They went and dumped them in Europe, the Chinese. And now the Europeans have put tariffs. Volkswagen and others are closing down plants and the Europeans are now going, we don't want to have to put tariffs on, but we're putting them on. Well, Australia doesn't have domestic vehicles, so therefore we will get a flood of Chinese vehicles and they'll go into Africa and range of people. And look, they're great vehicles, but this is the impact. Uh, it, what happens, America now is, represents the greatest sovereign risk for business and for countries around the world. It's, it's hard to believe, isn't it? But only under a Trump scenario, no, no, where no. he under brings Harris. this huge volatility. Well, Harris, Biden did it with, with, with the Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah. It had a big impact here. And the, the government had to respond with uh, domestic manufacturing policies and so on. That's all part of our response. And if you don't see that, it, you know, tariffs in the US, domestic policies in the US, tax policies in the US, immigration policies, they all have a profound impact on Australia. And the rest of the world, they do. Yeah. We'll go to the questions from the floor in a minute, but uh, the last one on my mind is uh, about Ukraine. During the debate, um, the last debate, uh, Donald Trump was asked uh, who he thought should win the war, and he didn't express an opinion about whether Ukraine should win, um, sort of a non-answer that was quite revealing. Do you think that he basically would, um, well, would he side with Russia in that conflict if he was if he was president, is that what uh, he wouldn't we're side at? with Russia? He'd try and broker a deal, and I, what I expect is Zelensky again said something stupid about Vance, and it was an off-the-cuff comment, which again fed the Republicans to thinking that Zelensky is a problem. A lot of Republicans, like Lindsey Graham and others, backed the the package to support Ukraine, and there is strong bipartisan support. Uh, at a certain level in the Congress for backing Ukraine. But what I expect is that if Trump is elected, he'll try to do something. Um, Zelensky may not be a party to, to that at first, but the US has already allocated so much money, and of the money they've allocated, I think 80% is going on domestic military manufacturing. So that the money being allocated to Ukraine, being spent in the US to produce the goods that go to Ukraine. Um, so I think Europe and NATO will have to step up, and they may step up. 
Uh, it's interesting the polls have some significant influence with Trump as well. It, you know, you, you... Do you mean the opinion polls? Are no, no, sorry, the, the polls. Oh, sorry, Polish. Polish government. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Those polls are better for him than the other polls. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the, the polls have got influence and a number of others are Hungarians. Okay. You know, there's many factors on and Trump. And the Saudis are going to have a big influence on Trump. Massive. They'll be more, arguably more influential, or I think they will be more influential than a non-Netanyahu-led Israel. Saudi Arabia will have profound impact and, uh, and, 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 and leverage on Trump. And, and, you know, that's another play. And again, everyone's trying to work out with uh, Kamala Harris how, what, it, what, it, what makes her heart beat in international relations. I mean, it's, it, that's why she'll be tested early, because people will be trying to work out what her priorities are and, you know, uh, Biden has been very strong. Joe Biden has been, you know, very strong and, and decisive, and that comes from all his experience. And He's been a really good ally to Australia and others. Mm. Now we'll go to questions from the floor, and the first one is from Tom McElroy. Thanks, David. Mr Hockey, Tom McElroy from the Financial Review. Apologies for pivoting to domestic politics, but there's been something of a spike in interest in your 2015 valedictory speech. It's a great speech. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wondered if you'd tell us your views on negative gearing now. Back then you said that it should be skewered towards adding to housing supply in Australia. I think there's real interest in your views today. Well, you've got to understand, negative gearing applies to every investment. So it applies to the stock market, it applies to anything you invest in. If, if you uh, borrow against that, then you can, you can claim a deduction against the income it produces. Um, what people don't realise is, historically, treasurers of all parties have skewed the tax system towards the pro what's deemed to be the productive dollar, which, if you put a dollar into BHP or, or Commonwealth Bank or anything, they take that dollar, they employ people, they buy machinery, they, it's a productive dollar. Um, if you put it into existing real estate, it's dormant, it becomes speculative. The dollar sort of disappears until you sell it again, right? Um, and so that's why everyone's kept stamp duty on real estate. That's why everyone's kept land tax on real estate. And they've removed stamp duty from shares. There's no land tax on shares. And you get, you know, a dividend imputation. You get franking credits on shares. So there's a massive incentive to go into equities rather than real estate. If you hold the real estate and you're getting a deduction, effectively, if you remove that deduction, you're increasing the tax on that individual. And that individual, if I'm, if I'm, if I've borrowed at eight percent to buy an investment property, uh, and I'm getting rental return of four percent, which is roughly what you get these days, and I'm deducting the other four percent, I'm hoping for a capital gain on that property. But if I lose it, I'll increase the rents. So if you're going to tinker with negative gearing, don't look first to the housing stock, look at the impact on rents. Because landlords who are struggling to pay uh, the interest on a loan against the property will increase the rents. So then you go down the path of Europe and others with rent control and rent subsidies. So the government's putting its dead hand right into the market. I've always believed, and it's, it applies in our foreign investment in residential real estate, you want to try and skew the system towards new real estate. That is, if you can have additional incentives for anyone who buys a new property, then it'll stimulate the housing market. But it's got to be a comprehensive plan. One of the things on housing, I mean, anyone that's done a renovation, oh my God, the red tape and the green tape, fees and so on, people are giving up. And the, and the, and the building community is ageing. Plumbers, electricians, you know, it, it's hard to get people into trade. So we're running short on workers. We've got big inflation in building. You've got massive red tape, green tape. Why would you build in Australia? And so you've got to have the tax system help you along that way. Yeah. Next question is from Sarah Eisen. 
Sarah Eisen from The Australian. Thank you for your address, Mr Hockey. Thanks, Sarah. You mentioned um, the Biden ba bans on Chinese-made EV vehicles. I just wanted to understand if you think that idea has merit, particularly maybe if we'd apply it in Australia. Would that ever be something that should be considered? We've already moved on some Chinese-made security cameras for government departments, obviously. There are some concerns in the solar panel industry and others. This sure. is the newest kind of front. Do you think that idea has merit? Look, if you've... I want to see the national security advice about, you know, if they're, if they're able to, uh, if, if adversaries, whether it be China or anyone else, if, if they're able to infiltrate the data, you know, if they're able to get the data off your travel uh, and, and out of the machines. I mean, um, China is still, you know, a manufacturing, exporting economy. And what they're doing is, with their uh, very aggressive approach to technology and using technology and data gathering, they're undermining their own manufacturing and exporting base. Amer the one thing you said at the beginning, David, that you know, it's, America's divided. The one thing it's absolutely united on is China. Understand this, the United States has never had an adversary that is both a military threat and an economic threat. They've had military threats, but they've never had both. And that is, you know, I, I have witnessed since we did the free trade agreement with China and, you know, Jack Lew was critical, the Secretary of the US Treasury was critical of me for um, having a screening program for foreign investment. He said, why are you doing that? We don't do it in America, you know, they can buy whatever they want. Well, that, I've seen them go 180 degrees. And now um, there are anti-China bills going through the US Congress that will be bipartisan. And frankly, the unintended consequences for Australian companies are very significant. Mm. And I've seen a draft of a bill uh, that will probably go up in what's known as the lame duck session between the election and the inauguration and has profound impact on us. And so, just to be clear, you'd be cautious for any EV, Chinese EV ban in Australia before significant yeah. national security. Yeah, yeah, well, that's right. I mean, we haven't got the, we're not making cars anymore, and um, everyone's got a view on that. But we're not making cars anymore. So the question is, you know, what are we banning? Hmm. What are we banning? It's um, yeah. thank you. A tricky area. Next question is from Jessica Wang. Thank you for your time, Mr. Hockey. Jessica Jess. Wang from Newswire. Um, with nuclear energy firming up to be a major election policy battleground, do you think the po uh, coalition's nuclear plan has merit, given it would slow down Australia's renewable rollout? And are the potential benefits worth it when weighed up against concerns of how it could affect overseas investment in domestic renewable projects? Oh, Jessica, I had 20 years of debate about climate change. I was sort of like exhausted by it. It was like, it's just... Don't you miss it? <laughs> oh, I miss it every day. I wake up and I say, I wish we could revisit the carbon tax. <laughs> Those calcium days of Gillard and Rudd and Turnbull and... Yeah, I miss that all. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't think the current debate's any better because... Um, you look at where the trends are. So uh, America is building data centres. You know, there was a huge transaction, biggest transaction this year in data centres in Australia. Um, and uh, uh, I went to the Republican, uh, to the Democrat, Democratic Convention and there was a panel with Tom Knight, who was Deputy Secretary to Hillary Clinton. I mean, it was meant to be Chatham House rules, but I don't think they applied in another country. And, um, uh, and he's now Deputy Chair of Blackstone. And uh, Penny Pritzker, who was a former Secretary of Commerce, and Gina Raimondo, who is the Secretary of Commerce. And they were talking about data centres, because Blackstone now is the um, biggest owner of data centres in the world. And someone asked the question, how are you going to power them? And America now is producing more energy than any other time. So Donald Trump's saying, let it rip. Well, it's letting rip now with all sorts of different energy. And um, the sort of consensus response was, well, we're going to have small nuclear reactors to power the data centres. Now, if you don't believe that, overnight, 
uh, Kamala Harris released her economic manifesto with three tiers, one of them was advanced nuclear energy. You know, Bill, Bill Gates has just bought Three Mile Island to do it up. I mean, we actually, I don't know how we're going to meet the massive demand of, of, for energy over the next few years. And then I listened to the ABC. I do, you see. And uh, I listened to the ABC the other morning and they said that uh, in a recent report that basically every, every projected... Uh, uh, every project forecast or, or promised over the next few years needs to be delivered on time and on budget to meet Australia's energy needs. And then I heard the ABC the other morning where they said 70% of renewable programs are actually located on Indigenous land. And I'm thinking to myself, how on God's earth are you going to carry the community with you, Indigenous community, and still deliver the renewables and still deliver the projects on time and on budget? I mean, you know, really? So that's a yes for nuclear? Well, <laughs> my view is it, 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 small nuclear reactors are coming and we're going to be buying them. Yeah. Whether it's whoever's in government, we'll be buying them. And, you know, other than that, I don't want my, the lights to go out on my kids and my grandkids. Now, you said a moment ago that the ABC, or you listen to the ABC. Uh, the ABC clearly listens to you. Our next question is from David Spears. Oh. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your ongoing support for the ABC. Uh, <laughs> it's a free promo. That's great. I know I cut your budget in 14, but we're all over that, aren't we? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll there were no that. grudges, David. Though. None, none. Um, good, good to see you again. Thanks, thanks so much uh, for being here. And just to pull together, I guess, a few threads of what you've, what you've talked about, I'm really interested in um, the pessimism about what's happening to the economy, regardless of who wins in the US, uh, what's going to happen on tariffs, but also what we've seen under the Inflation Reduction Act under Biden uh, to try and draw that manufacturing back to the US. And I guess, what, what does it mean for Australia? Can we, how do we, if there's this tariff war, the US, China, Europe, can we in Australia stand against that tide and say, look, back to basics, we'll be fine, we'll just have, you know, do this the way we always have and support free trade and so on? Or do we need to get in on this act with things like Future Made in Australia, tax production credits and so on, to get in on this game as well? What do we do in this environment? Well, we back Australian industry of manufacturing and innovation. You know, the US, everyone talks about the demise of the US. It's, it's just not real because the US marries innovation and capital like no other jurisdiction on earth. Um, and, you know, if you compare the US economy in, say, 1990 to Europe, you know, the US is a third bigger than it was against Europe over that time. And it's because of that marriage. American innovation now in AI, in uh, quantum computing, in a range of things, in healthcare, it's going to be a big driver for the world economy over the next few years. So we want to stick close. We want to keep prosecuting the case that we have a free trade agreement. What worked with Trump, as I said, under our trading relationship, you win. You've got a big trade surplus with us. And they throw, oh, but you've got a big trade surplus with China. I go, isn't that great? Someone's getting stuff out of China. We're on your side. And they, oh, OK, yeah, maybe that works. You know, so, because it ends up going back to the US because we've got a trade deficit with the US. So, you know, you've got to come down to those basics. Um, in, you know, Australia can't go... We've, we've become incredibly prosperous as a result of free and open trade because we produce more than we consume as a nation. And now we're seeing this fantastic wave of innovators out of Australia, but the market in Australia just isn't big enough for them. So we've got to get into the US. Europe's sort of, you know, flatlining. Asia's very difficult to navigate. China is difficult to manufacture in. US and, and, you know, is a great opportunity for Australian companies, but we need the bigger market. And so we've, we've got to keep those barriers low with the US. The challenge will be the, the currencies. You know, there's going to be a big, I think, of course, I'm not allowed to forecast currencies, but... Well, you're not treasurer now. You can forecast currencies, can't you? Yeah, but I need to have an Australian financial licence. Okay. I introduced them in 1998. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no one else to blame. That would look a little weird, wouldn't it? Right. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, but look, the, I think that it's going to be a rocky time with the currencies. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question from Dan Jervis Barty. Dan Jervis Barty from the West Australian. Thanks for your appearance, Mr. Hockey. Just picking up on something that David said about tax production credits, your involvement in the United States has given you a window into what's offered under the US Inflation Reduction Act. What is your view on the proposal that the, the federal government has to incentivise green hydrogen production and critical minerals uh, refining and processing? Yeah. And, and is the coalition, the federal coalition here wrong to oppose them? Well, again, I don't want to get into domestic politics, but um, what the US is doing in the Department of Energy in the US and the Department of Defence is they're finally trying to protect their supply chains. You know, um, it's ironic, the US Department of Defence has had a law for many years that everything that goes to defence needs to come from the United States, uniforms, guns and so on. And then during COVID, they worked out that if a soldier is injured in the field and gets antibiotics, all the ingredients come from India and China. So they've never looked through their supply chains. And now the US is, on a bipartisan level, looking right through their supply chains. And they've realised in critical minerals and rare earths, they have to go to Australia. And they've got an exemption for free trade partners. So we have a free trade agreement with the US. Um, Canada has obviously NAFTA, but a number of countries that have critical minerals and rare earths don't, so they don't get that privileged access. Now you're seeing the US actually look at and starting to invest in Australian companies in Australia that are going to produce for the US. So in order to get the minerals out of the ground in Australia, we've had to rely on the Chinese coming along and saying, we're going to have a contract with you and We'll, the value of our contract with you will be how you develop mine, but it all comes to China for refining. And I think it's absolutely right. We need to refine in Australia. And if we do, it'll be our next wave of iron ore. But except the difference will be we process it here. Mm. We're not putting it on the ship. And it's really important that we invest in processing here, even though it's an initial loss leader. And in terms of, from your understanding of the policy that's proposed by the federal government, is that the right policy to unlock I, I, that opportunity? I just don't want to get into, thanks, but I won't get into those, the details of the individual policies. The thing is, we've got to move quickly. It's all about supply chain. Everything's supply chain. And, and you know, uh, Trump announced it overnight. Harris gave her big economic statement. She said the same overnight. Harris and Trump are in absolutely synchronised on the fact that America needs to have a reliable, safe supply chain. And Australia, how we do it uh, is, you know, it's a domestic debate, but what we do need is processing here as well as mining. Next question from Ben Westcott. Ben Westcott from Bloomberg. Thank you very much for your speech, Ambassador, and thank you for the tip that Chatham House rules don't apply in other countries. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Said. Um, uh, in terms of a second Trump administration, which, as you sort of say, is 50 50 percent chance. Um, last time Donald Trump was in the White House, we had a centre right government in Australia. This time, you know, at least for the first six months, we'll have a centre left government for sure in Australia. I mean, how do you think Australia should go about navigating that? Will those sort of um, people who helped out the first time, such as yourself and Prime Minister Scott, former Prime Minister Scott Morrison, be helpful in the second Trump administration? And what sort of stuff's going on behind closed doors to bring? Uh, to sort of prepare for a potential second Trump administration? Well, I was hoping to get through the National Press Club without mentioning his name. But Kevin Rudd is doing a pretty good job. <laughs> it's like, he's doing a good job, actually, and he has worked over the Republicans that will be influential with Trump. Uh, but it's also, it, in my view, it doesn't matter whether you're Liberal, Labor, Green, whatever, it, you know, Australia first, and everyone, everyone steps up. And you never know where the angle will be. There'll be business people that have dealt with Harris. There'll be people that are friends of Harris. Uh, there'll be friends of ours that work with Harris. A number of people that advise my firm, Bondi, uh, are very close to you know, Harris and her team. And I know, I found out this morning, one of them's been advising on national security, which I didn't <laughs> know about. But, um, uh, but you know, they're, they're you know, Australia first. 
And, and I think there's such enormous goodwill towards Australia. And the beauty of it is it goes down to everyday Americans. You know, a, a vast number of Americans couldn't find us on a map, but they like us. <laughs> they like us. And, you know, that's pretty good. Thanks. Next, qu Next question from Sarah Tomeska. Thank you for your time. Sarah Tomevska from SBS. Um, Trump has said that if Kamala Harris wins, Israel will cease to exist. You mentioned he likes to make absurd comments for cut through. Do you think that was an absurd comment? And having known him personally, what impact do you think a second Trump presidency would have on the escalating situation in the Middle East? Good question. Uh, well, of course that comment's absurd. Israel will exist whether Trump's president or Harris and, and will continue to exist. Um, you know, Netanyahu was advised after the horrible attack by Hamas that the first priority was take out Hezbollah because they represent the much bigger threat to the safety and security of Israel. And I say this as someone who's half Palestinian, so, you know, I've been involved one way or another all my life. And, uh, you know, because of the missile attacks from Hezbollah immediately after those October attacks, um, more than, around 70,000 people left northern Israel. And they'll never go back whilst Hezbollah remains a threat and is lobbing missiles. And I think uh, is the IDF has taken the lessons from Gaza, tragic, tragic as they are, and has worked out how to be more precise, thank God, about taking out the terrorist group. Uh, Biden sent a second carrier group to the Middle East after Iran threatened retaliation recently, and there's been no retaliation. America stepped up to stop the retaliation, and it worked so far. But Netanyahu, is, he, he's lost patience, and, you know, it's interesting to see the reaction in Israel where there wasn't, there's no great affection for Netanyahu, but he got a surge of support after the recent actions in southern Lebanon. You'll never get people back into northern Israel if they feel as though they're going to have missiles lob on their heads every but night. Do, do you think Trump would effectively give Netanyahu carte blanche to do whatever he wants going forward? Biden has at least urged, you know, a cautious approach limiting civilian deaths? No, I don't, think, I don't think Trump would. As I say, the Saudis will have a big influence. Big influence on Trump. Both at a, you know, it's not just the obvious economic influence, but it's strategic influence. And don't forget, Trump, Trump administration delivered the Abraham Accords. And I think what triggered the whole goddamn thing at the end was Brett Bayer on Fox did an interview with MBS where MBS flagged, this is just before the October attacks, MBS flagged that there was going to be an announcement soon on an agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel. This is Mohammed bin Salman, the head yeah. of Saudi Arabia. Yeah, and, and, you know, he flagged it. At that time, I went, holy cow. How, how are people going to react? Well, you saw a big chunk of that reaction. Thank you. And the next question is from Dominic Giannini. Thanks, Mr. Hockey. Dominic Giannini from Australian Associated Press. This is the um, first time I've enjoyed questions from the press gallery. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think... Well, this is like question time. I miss question time. We'll have you back. And uh, given your mention of Kevin Rudd, your former Sunrise um, yeah, no, uh, co-star, right. I think we'll have you both back. I told him to get rid of the beard. <laughs> <laughs> what is that about? Anyway, it's um, I just want to ask about <laughs> the same topic. So Palestine's envoy in Australia has asked Australia to expeditiously recognise a Palestinian state, worried that if Trump gets in, that it would push back progress on that. Um, I just want to know your views about how you see both uh, candidates, how foreign policy under them could change that, and should Australia be working close, closely, more closer with the US on recognition? You know, it's a vexed question. Um, what are you recognising? What do you recognise? Because there's not, nothing in Gaza, there's no leadership. And you weren't going to recognise Hamas. Um, and as for the West Bank, Palestinian Authority is just so, so corrupt. 
The question is, you know, what are you aiming to get at? Um, I think what's most concerning is no one knows what Plan B is. You know, how are you going to govern? Israel said they're going to go into Gaza whenever they feel there's a threat. Well, you can't be a sovereign country if that's the case. But if you're going to go into that neighbourhood, go down the street with your tanks in Gaza whenever you feel there's a threat, you, you own it. You've got to give them health care. You've got to give them education. You've got to, you own that country. So you can't, no, there's no sovereign nation on earth that just lets the next door neighbour just walk in and then claim to be sovereign. So it cannot be resolved without Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Turkey being at the table. It can't. And they've shown no willingness to be at the table. Um, you know, and poor old Jordan, you saw the King of Jordan recently just say, you know, hang on, this isn't going to become a Palestinian state. Of course it's not. We've seen horrendous history in Jordan over the years, you know, involving Palestinians. Where are they going to go? So, but you're never going to get, you're never going to get a resolution until you have everyone at the table, Israel and the Saudis and the Egyptians. The Egyptians are still absolutely crucial. And you can't have Turkey on the sidelines declaring, you know, Israel a, a, you know, a, a, an evil state. You, you've got to bring the key players. Is it even possible at this point to look at the US election in November and, and foresee one scenario for the Middle East under one outcome and a different scenario for the Middle East under a different outcome on November 4th? Well, it's all, it does come back to raw politics and the Democrats are very exposed in Michigan. There are some districts in Michigan which are crucial which have a very big Palestinian, pro-Palestinian population and big registration. Um, so that's tempered Harris's language. They're trying to thread the needle here, the Democrats, whereas Trump, and you can see it in the polling, the Jewish demographic has surged for Trump. It's, I, I don't think it, it's influential for money. It influences you know, uh, a bit of Silicon Valley and certainly New York, but he's had a surge of support in, uh, in the Jewish community in America. Next but the, but the, the other community, the Islamic Arab community, is, is bigger. Next question from Jacob Grieber. Mm. Uh, Jacob Grieber from the ABC. Um, when I observed you in DC as ambassador a few years ago, you were obviously very well connected. So. Looking forward to both sides, what's your best bet on who has the following jobs? Treasury Secretary, Federal Reserve uh, Head and Secretary of State. <laughs> well, you know, I'm in the private sector now, I charge people for that. <laughs> what a good, um, Put it out there for free on the ABC. OK. <laughs> and you can charge for it. Um, Look, uh, okay, under Trump, I think Bill, Bill Hegarty is sort of more favoured to be Secretary of State, Secretary of Defence, you know, and this is movable. Um, or Secretary of State could also be Steve Mnuchin, who's quite keen to come back, former Secretary of Treasury. Um, I'm hoping Pompeo would come back as Secretary of Defence in some, some position. Uh, Treasury, I think he'll be... You know, I think Bob Lighthizer is really keen to get... And that he is big on tariffs, the former USTR. Uh, but there's, you know, a plethora of other people and there's many reasons why any of those could be ruled out. Under Harris, one thing I can say to you is I think there'll be a massive turnover under Harris. Joe Biden's team really treated Harris poorly. And I think she has a good memory for that. Obama has brought in quite a team behind her. They're very good and very professional and they are, they've helped to build the momentum behind Harris. Um, so, you know, the obvious candidate for Secretary of Treasury would be Gina Raimondo, who was probably going to get it. Janet Yellen, who you recall, she's fantastic, but Janet Yellen was meant to retire. Or the rumour was she was going to retire as Secretary of Treasury, having served at the Fed. Um, mid-term and then Gina Raimondo would go from commerce into there. Anyway, Gina Raimondo would be the logical one. There'll be always rumours about a Jamie Dimon and all this. I just don't think that's going to happen. Um, and after that, uh, in terms of the Fed, 
Uh, Jay Powell will see out his term. Um, Which goes till early. Yeah, yeah, basically. yeah. And look, I don't know. I don't know about the Fed. There are so many moving pieces. And that requires... All of these require Senate approval. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hopeful but I'm confident that at the end of the day... Uh, I, look, the, the Republicans are going to control the Senate. Highly likely. Therefore... And, but they'll find it hard to get people through if there aren't sensible choices. So under Trump, they need to be sensible. They can't be the crazies. You know, Steve Bannon is not going to be Secretary of State. I hope. Who, who will be Harris, though? <laughs> Sorry? Who, who's Harris's Secretary of State? It's the last one you didn't mention. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, OK, here's a left field. Look, left field, Hillary Clinton. That's left field. Thank you. Next question is from Eleanor Campbell. Hello, Eleanor Campbell from the Canberra Times. Um, do you think diplomatic immunity should apply to cases of workplace exploitation and modern slavery, given the ongoing cases that we're seeing in embassies, both here in Australia and the US? I don't know. If you could <laughs> touch on your experience as a former ambassador. Well, <laughs> you know, I think it was uh, a Bruce Willis film that popularised the concept of diplomatic immunity. Right, and I, I never really, we never exercise diplomatic immunity and I don't think it's particularly real. Uh, it, it can be in the most egregious of cases and where there is a strong national opinion, but if you invoke diplomatic immunity, it comes back on you depending who you do it with. If you do it with, if Australia did it with a small country that we don't have really deep diplomatic or commercial relationships with, then you can do that, but you need to have a really strong reason to do so, particularly within the Australian framework. But if you invoke diplomatic immunity with the United States, it would be a very serious issue. So it depends who it's with, and it's very subjective. It's the, it's the back, it's the last card you bring out. So there needs to be absolute, you know, you need to have total conviction this is in your national interest to invoke it. The, uh, the next question is from Anthony Galloway. Thank you, Anthony Galloway from Capital Brief. Um, I think you said before Saudi Arabia won't just be influential on Trump in regards to the Middle East, but Ukraine as well. From the outside, it looks like Saudi Arabia has been largely ambivalent about the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Where, where do their actual interests lie and, and what are their views? Well, Saudi Arabia is determined to be a significant global power. Um, you know, you talk about manufacturing protection, there are funds that have been set up by, uh, you know, the leadership of Saudi Arabia that will pay for you to move your manufacturing to Saudi Arabia and they'll build your factory. And uh, there's advanced manufacturing in Australia that finds that pretty compelling to not only will they build you a brand new factory, uh, you zero tax over there. You know, pretty good when you pay 50% here. Uh, so. We're in a very competitive environment and Saudi Arabia is flexing its, massively flexing its, uh, its economic muscle. Um, and uh, um, I think, you know, others are struggling to compete. Others are, Europe is, you know, in, it, Europe's in a pretty difficult place. Germany, Italy, you know, I think that I'm, I'm quite worried about where Europe Europe is at. America has the capacity to be somewhat isolationist but also has the capital base to be able to rescue the situation. But parts of Europe are facing significant challenge, not just from China but also from the Middle East. So yep. Saudi Arabia, Ukraine, sorry? Oh, on Ukraine. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't think I said that they'd have a big impact on Ukraine. They'll have a big impact on Gaza and Israel. Mm. But the Saudis like to keep the door open to Russia. So, a lot of, you, you, can, you, you know, you're, you're starting to see the evidence of um, export, you know, that there's sanctions on Russia. So there's been a massive surge in exports to Azerbaijan and Armenia and all these other countries that have very close relationships with Russia. So, you know, and India is sort of another one where you see them sort of hedging a little bit. They're on our side, but, you know, 
they're also got very much an open door uh, dialogue with Russia. We've got a little bit of time for two more questions, and the second last goes to Brandon Howe. Uh, thank you, Brandon Howe from innovationoz.com. Uh, Ms Hockey, you mentioned the need to back in more local innovation, uh, but it's generally understood that um, there's not enough Australian capital uh, flowing to these pre-profit companies that are trying to commercialise R&D. Um, what needs to be done so that these innovative companies um, don't have to move their manufacturing and R&D to the US to access that um, very mature market uh, for scale-up funding, as you mentioned? Well, one of the things my firm has is an investment fund, and we have Australia's only national security investment fund. And when I raised the fund with, in a joint venture with Elliston Capital, Ashok Jacob, who's well known, um, when we raise the capital, you know, don't go to institutions here. They don't want to have anything to do with national security. Uh, so I had to go to high net worth individuals in Australia, the US and now the UK to raise money to invest in Australian companies that are dual purpose, so they're defence and uh, commercial, and they're blowing the charts off the rest of the world. And so I had to go offshore as well as some well-meaning individuals onshore in order to try and create an asset class. And, you know, I'm, I'm relieved Hanwha's not buying Austal. I was always opposed to it. Uh, and why? Because if we haven't got a defence prime in Australia, then how on God's earth are we going to ensure we don't get in the same position as COVID and end up with no manufacturing base to meet our national security needs? So, you know, it was reported that my firm was making a bid for Austal a while back. We, we were raising capital. It was $1.90 and now it's $3 because we could see how that company was going to become a prime. Now, in order to help defence in Australia, we've got a lot of companies in national security that in space, in, in all sorts of innovation, fantastic companies, they're starved of capital. The government has always had to write out a cheque to those companies. But in America, you've got, and Europe, you've got, and BAE, I see here, you've got, you've got companies that triage the small players for government. They say, this is a good technology, that's good technology, we'll put money in, government can put money in. In Australia, we haven't got a prime. We're one of only two or three companies, uh, countries in the world that hasn't got a major defence prime in the top 20 spending on expenditure. And I have been adamant and continue to be adamant that if AUKUS and all these other things are just us, Australian taxpayers, writing out a cheque to America or to Britain, then you'll soon lose public support. It won't... Australians won't cop it. We have to be able to invest in our own businesses and we need to have a national prime to help the government triage all the great innovation would and also the allocation of capital. Would something uh, like a defence-led VC fund uh be a function that would... But it's got a back... Investment. But VCs, are, are, you know, are too speculative. We, we do a bit of VC. There's lots of issues with VC, but... Thank yep, you. There's, we can talk about that offline. We'll have to go to the last question, which goes to David Lipson. Yep. Hello, David Lipson from the ABC. Thank you, Mr Hockey, for the ABC your words. The ABC here, so it's fantastic. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, just back on the US election... Obviously, the cutbacks to free to air have made a difference. <laughs> <laughs> Um, back on the US election, I think after the last eight years, we've all got a pretty good sense of who Donald Trump is. Yeah. Um, I read the other day that the harris Walls camp has done seven interviews and press conferences in the time that they have taken the limelight. The, uh, the Trump-Vance ticket has done 70. Um, do you think that we or, or the American people know enough about Kamala Harris, yeah. and is there anything in that sort of lack of knowledge that we should be yeah. watching or concerned about? Really great question, David. Um, so this election, presidential election, is the first ticket since 1980 that hasn't had a Clinton, a Bush or a Biden on it. So nearly 50 years since there was a presidential campaign without a Clinton, a Bush or a Biden. And Americans are asking, who's Harris? Who's Waltz? And, you know, it, it remains a mystery and it's compounded by the fact that the re-elect on Biden is so poor. 
Harris has had to differentiate herself from Biden, not on policy, but actually on, on personality. So everyone else has defined her personality and lifted her up. But I think the biggest challenge she has is there is no policy differentiation from Biden. So, you know, I was looking at her economic statement today and there's just nothing particularly new. She's got price controls, which won't happen on groceries and a few other things, but there's nothing really differentiating her. So you look over the next few weeks, Trump's going to prosecute the economy uh, and prosecute immigration, which is a very, very, you know, hot button issue in America. He's going to prosecute those. And Harris is going to prosecute abortion, which is really, you know, it's unbelievable to the Australian audience that America is even debating the issue. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I get cringe every time I see that debate in America. It's, it should be just settled as a health issue, and, and you know, but anyway, um, and and uh, but she's prosecuting it. She's getting a surge of female support, younger groups. It's the number one issue for young American women, um, and you know, who know who knows where it leads. But I think uh, I, I I don't. I, my, my residual concern for the Harris campaign is she still remains too much of a mystery to Mary Milwaukee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, before we uh, wrap up, here is your national membership card because you are welcome back oh, is that right? at any time.